Hi, I'm Jerry James Stone and I'm super excited about today's video because I get to share something with you that is super delicious, plus also really, really special. So today I'm making a recipe from Freddie Prince Jr.'s cookbook, his new cookbook, his first cookbook called Back to the Kitchen. Now, what's cool about this is I always, being a cookbook author myself, I always appreciate when someone enters into this fold because it's not easy. You pour a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in it, and this is a really good book. If you're looking for a book that's easily accessible with some fun, healthy, delicious recipes, there's not some, some unhealthy recipes too, so don't worry, you can indulge, but it's a great book, and I think that you're really gonna enjoy the recipe that we're doing today. It's actually, uh, from his book, it's actually his mom's recipe. It's this Grand Marnier French toast, which is super, super indulgent. But I had to amp it up a few levels. But before I get to showing you that recipe, I have, a, I have something you're really gonna love. I have an interview with Freddie Prince Jr. We sat down, we chatted, we talked about stuff. I think, you, I think you're gonna love everything he has to say. Super charming guy, a lot of fun. And I think I'm gonna show you that first and then we'll get to cooking, okay? Okay, Freddie, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good, man. Sorry for the handheld action here. I don't mean to... <laughs> You need a selfie stick, you know, to kind of... I need, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's funny. I use these technologies to chat with people to do these interviews, and I've tried everything, and the most consistent thing is Google, which is also not very consistent. So uh, there's, <laughs> always, there's always a little bit of a technical hiccup, so I always add padding for that time. But it, you I'm actually... Not, I'm not good with technology, but like Charlie Chaplin, I love it, and I think it uh, connects us all. So I'm very pro-technology. Well, I, you, you come across as very tech savvy based on all the things you do because you do Twitch and I mean, because you're on there, right? You're, you're gaming on oh, no. Twitch. Oh, uh, you're already, the, it's, the stream's already getting choppy. Ah, well, hopefully it'll, it'll keep going. I think it'll work its way out. Uh, sometimes the live, I yeah, see, it'll catch up. <laughs> I seem tech savvy because I'm into video games and, and Star Wars. Nice t-shirt, by the way. But uh, when it comes to wiring something together, you're lucky I can get put batteries in a remote control, man. <laughs> I'm the worst. <laughs> fair enough. Okay, fair enough. Well, you're doing a really good job at like not coming across as a Luddite. Like, it seems like you're a total pro, so... Congrats to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm acting. I'm acting. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, actually, I wanted to ask you, actually, this is one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about. So we, I have your book here. I have this. I, I just I, I want to point out there's a flaw in mine. Um, is there? It doesn't have your signature. I'll stop it. I'll get you one with your signature. <laughs> <in it. laughs> but, yeah. So I have your book. And um, I'll, I'll be honest. I was a little, you know, it's always, this is your first cookbook. Right. Okay. So first cookbook, I was a little worried when I hit you up for an interview because I had not seen the book yet. So you never know what you're going to get with someone. And I mean that with, you know, a top chef to whatever, but it's actually it's a really good book. It's actually really oh, thank good. You. Those are, that's um, nice of you to say. Well, and it's not, I mean, like, well, no, what I love about it and actually, so in, I'll just compare it to my first cookbook. You did a much better job than I did because yours is really accessible, which is what I love about it. It's like the recipes are interesting creative you know, like anyone can dive in and do them my book is not that way <laughs> so <laughs> i you're totally probably more you're probably yeah. more advanced down that road than i am though you know my my goal for this was you know i grew up loving to sorry for the thumb in the shot by the way That's i grew up loving loving to cook it was what my mom was great at her cookbook would be much more complicated <laughs> i wanted to do something that was more my style and I wanted to write something that even if you didn't cook, you could enjoy because there's stories in there. And then maybe at the end of one of those stories, you actually look at the recipe and you go, man, that's only nine ingredients, man. I can do this. And then you'll actually sit down and do it. So that was really the goal. So when I hear people say that, I'm very, very grateful for those words because that was myself and, and Rachel and my editor, Dervla. I mean, that was sort of the goal that we all jumped on with in the beginning. Well, see, and yeah, you did an excellent job at that. And I think, you know, with me, I, I just kind of got carried away because my first creative project. And so I just, it was like my baby and I wanted to like show what I could do. And then I kind of, you know, yeah, of course, spiral out a little bit. So I think that you did a really good job of that. And I think that's important because it kind of captures the title too, like getting back to the kitchen and it doesn't have to be complicated to cook something delicious. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a great book, but I, I'm kind of wondering how, like, you know, how it compares, like, creatively speaking, you're a creative person, obviously, being an actor. Like, what's the approach versus, you know, an acting role versus, like, the sort of creative product, the, like, creating this cookbook? 
I only know one way to, regardless of, of the foundation that I want to sort of create art on, I only know one way to approach it. And that was through martial arts. So I do is through repetition until it's muscle memory and it's no longer a conscious thought like that the whole philosophy of be water be like water like bruce lee would say the philosophy in layman terms is muscle memory you do the same thing enough or you see the same action enough times it's no longer a thought for you you can anticipate it your body will naturally move the way it needs to move so as hokey and as eastern philosophy as it may sound that's my same approach with cooking i mean i probably had a hundred and somewhere between 120 and 140 recipes. And it was, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 times over a nine month period of trying to make sure I put the easiest ones in there and a few more that had a bit, a bit more complexity to them. Frying food seems easy. It's not. So I tried to put a, a bit more complex things in there with those as a, as a starting block. But for me, it's always repetition, like rehearsals on in a play. Um, and I hate doing plays because I hate saying the same thing every single day. But it's no different for a, a film or a TV show or to learn how to throw a proper, you know, right, right punch to the camera. Like, you know, your fist has to rotate. Your thumb has to be here, not on the inside when you're a little kid, you know. OK, I, I, I get that. Actually, I took Taekwondo as a kid. I, I understand that sort of, you know, I appreciate that. I don't do it anymore, but I did. <laughs> so I, I love pretty... Taekwondo. I love Taekwondo. Do you study, uh, do you have a, a couple art forms that you study or is there one that you're most proficient in? I, uh, well, I have multiple black belts. I have one in Kempo. I have one in, in uh, Tangsudo, which is the Korean foundation that Chinese Taekwondo was built upon. Uh, my oh. godfather, Bob Wall, he's was one of the first masters of it here in America back in the 70s. So I didn't have a choice. I didn't learn how to throw a football but I'll choke Ben Roethlisberger out in about 30 seconds. <laughs> so I still, I still get to throw a spiral though. So he's got me beat there. Well, and you mentioned, okay, so you've talked about how food was like a big part of your family. Your mom was, your mom cooked, and your mom's a big part of this book too. You sort of, in the stories yeah. and stuff. Um, you, did you cook a lot as a kid or was it sort of, did you just get to consume everything that she made? Bo both. Um, I mean, it was a really big deal for her to sort of teach me about life over the stove because that's where she was most confident so it's like i do a lot of video game streams and i stream with uh, just randomly a lot of uh, a lot of veterans of war veterans and some people who have suffered from ptsd and they start within a few minutes speaking to me about a lot of hardcore stuff things that if i wasn't recording i would allow to, to sort of move me to tears and and let me cry but i even told the guy I said hey man i'm streaming if you don't want to say that and he over the mic, this is a man that I've never met. He says, this is where I feel most comfortable gaming. And I'm really, I have a, a good thing going with you. And I want to talk about this. And I need to talk about this. So I should. And I find that when people are sort of in their most confident space, their, their kingdom, so to speak, you can get the most honesty out of them. And so my mom told me a lot about my father over the stove, a lot about his qualities, a lot about his faults. Um, and other relatives in our family as well. I had a, a relative who was a racist and, and I didn't know what that word meant. And my mom had to break down what racism was. And when you're a kid, you're like, but that doesn't make sense. I just like hanging out with Marcus cause he's fun. Right. Like it had nothing to do with him being black. And my mom, I remember the look on her face and it wasn't like, Oh, what a sweet boy. It was disappointment in like the rest of planet earth basically and that's because we, she was teaching me how to make miso soup from scratch over the over the stovetop man it, you know and so that, that's where all the i learned about world war ii because my grandpa was on the uss nevada which was wow. the only ship or maybe one of two ships to escape pearl harbor when it was bombed by the japanese wow. and that's how i learned about it so when i went to school and they started teaching my hand was the first one raised and I'm like, teacher, teacher, my grandfather was Benito Raposardi and he was on the USS Nevada. And <laughs> the teacher's looking at me like, what the hell is the USS Nevada, kid? Like, he doesn't even know. <laughs> so that's where a lot of my lessons came from. My godfather, Bob Wall. Oh, my puppy just came to say hi. Uh -huh. my puppy. Uh -huh. Ah, bro. <laughs> you're, you're a better pet. Um, and I cook for her too. I, I locked my cat. I just got a new kitten. She's two months old. 
and I locked her in my bedroom because she literally has been running around knocking everything over. So I was afraid she would hang up on you if I let her out here. So she'd run across she, the keyboard. She would. <laughs> Cats do their own thing. God, dogs need us. Cats are like, eh, yeah. whatever, feed me. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but, yeah, go, but going back to the families, but uh, my godfather was the same way. You know, there's a, a hamburger in there called the Bob Wall Burger. And uh, it's in the cookbook. And it's this. It's the story of kind of me getting to have if you don't have a father you can relate to this but as a young boy all i ever wanted was to like wake up for that midnight snack where you sneak in the kitchen and make a peanut butter and jelly and see your dad already in there and have him make the sandwich and split it with you and you each have half and you got a glass of milk or whatever your fantasy was if, if you didn't have a dad right. and i never got that um and bob wall was a big father figure in my life and that was the first time that and i i had already had the fantasy a, a thousand times if i had it once and to get to sit with him and have that burger he never knew what it meant to me until i told him when i was like maybe 30 years old <laughs> but for me like that's a memory that will never ever ever go away because that was that father sandwich that you had um and for me that's it doesn't it doesn't get any better than that so family and food you can see if you read two stories in the cookbook, anybody out there, you'll know real quick that family and food for, for me go hand in hand. Well, yeah, I mean, it's very clear in the book and, I, and I'm with you. I, I think food is community and it's really about everyone sort of coming together at the table and conversing no matter who you are and sharing yeah. great recipes. And you know, I grew up cooking with my family. My mom was a huge influence on me. Like we, she's full Armenian and she cooked a lot of, we had sort of had like this mix of middle, uh, Midwest food, my dad, my dad passed when I was in college, and, but we had a lot of Midwest food and then also like Armenian food. So um, that was a huge influence on what I ate. I live in LA, man. We got good Armenian food. Here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you should come to Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, it, I need to, I'm going to be down there later this year. I, I'm looking forward to it for that reason. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but no, you, you're right. In this book, I mean, like there's just, you know, story after story and like your family, obviously, I mean, your family is famous. So there's that aspect of it too. So we're kind of used to seeing you guys together, but like, I mean, it's just a really nice kind of comforting book. That's really accessible. You mentioned that there was a lot of recipes. I'm kind of curious about where you started. Like are all the recipes in here stuff that you've been making for a long time or is there new recipes? Um, there's, I'd say about a quarter, about maybe 20 of them were things that were new over the last like year to nine months. But most of it is stuff that I either learned from my mother fortunate that I was in a profession that took me all over the world and I got to eat at some of the greatest restaurants on earth. And before I would ever make friends with an actor, I would make friends with a chef. The only <laughs> actor I'm really friends with, I marry. So, you know, when we'd be on location, like I'd be in Toronto and the cast would be going out to clubs and bars and hanging out. And I would be at Lee Soussaire's restaurant in Toronto in the kitchen begging him to teach me how to make the things he was making to the point where he just gave me the phone number to the kitchen, not his own number, <laughs> just the kitchen. And I could call them and come in and eat foie gras until I was going to puke, basically. <laughs> but um, that was my my experience in, in Hollywood, you know. I just felt like I had more in common with with those chefs than than with my peers. and I, Or I would have, if I was on set, I always had more in common with the stunt guys because between takes, I'd be teaching them jujitsu, you know what I mean? And be like, no, nah, bro, you're doing it wrong. you got to hit out and get my back. And so we just got along cool because – you know, they all like to fight and be tough guys, and, and I could show them newer ways to, to do that. I remember my main stunt guy, his name's Troy Robinson. He's, he's a huge stunt guy now, and he got way too buff to be my stunt guy. <laughs> but he was my stuntman in the I Know You Did Last Summer movies, and his dad was uh, Dar Robinson, the famous stuntman who had the static line jump off the CN Tower in the friggin' 80s before static lines were even scientifically safe and designed. And he lost his father as, as well and was following the exact same path I was, just in a different profession. But it's all show business, so it's all the same. Yeah. And he and I bonded instantly on a passion of martial arts. And we used to go to this place in Los Angeles called Roscoe's uh, Chicken and Waffles, which is a famous place. They didn't have the best fried chicken. That was a place called Dinah's, um, which is now going out of business. Mm -hmm. But we loved that fried chicken. And I remember telling him, I said, hey, man, let me make you fried chicken the way I make it. 
and you tell me if you like this stuff better. He's like, bro, I'm not going to like your chicken more than Roscoe's chicken and waffles. I was like, bro, my fried chicken is a thousand <laughs> times better than theirs. And I cooked it for him, and mine has a little bit of spice in it, a little bit of heat, and he went bananas for it. And so those are like – those are the guys that I liked hanging out with. You know what I mean? Because we yeah. could wrestle for an hour and then cook food and watch like a football game later. So it was, it was just a very organic way to cook a meal for somebody and get somebody into cooking. Well, just kind of touching on some of the things that you mentioned. I am a huge Kevin Williamson fan, so I love the oh, yeah. I Know What You Did Last Summer movie. Um, one of my favorite movies that I've, I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it, which I think that Kevin Williamson particularly likes killing off your wife. I mean, like, you know, the movies that she's been in, like, it's always a really long, slow, painful death for her. So, you know, and I, I think Kevin likes killing pretty girls in general, but Sarah has yeah. died quite often. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm also a huge Buffy fan. So, you know, like, it was always like, come on, just, you know, like, I was always hoping that she would be the one that would, would see it through. That she would have magical powers and, and beat everybody. Something. I, yeah. Powers. <laughs> no, Kevin, Kevin is a great guy. You know, I almost came out of retirement. He was doing a, a new show. I don't know what happened to it, but it was like about sex crimes or something like that. And they wanted me for a role that I didn't want to do. And they already kind of had another guy for the role that I like. And I just said, look, you're not going to give me the role, but I'll come in and read for it. Let me just, cause I haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> and he was like, okay. He's like, but you can't like, they're not going to give you that role. I was like, I don't care. I know my audition will be better than whoever got it. And at least, you know, we can hang out and talk. So I went in and they still asked me to read the other role. I was like, nah, that's boring. I'm not going to do that. Yes, man, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, like Barry and Ray got equal love, and I know you did. In this TV show, they did not get equal love. And so the one that I, I read for, I did. I went and did it, and I felt really good about it, I, even though I knew I wasn't going to get it. But it was just an excuse for Kevin and I after the audition to walk back to my car and catch up and talk about old time because we both got so old, you know. Like <laughs> dude, I didn't have one gray hair the last time I saw Kevin. Williams. <laughs> now I'm counting. Now I'm counting blacks. So it's. <laughs> it's it was such a cool experience to get to sort of relive, even though it was a 20 minute experience. It's one of those things that yeah. when you, when you made friends with enough people in this business and lost them too soon, those quick little 20 minute memories last forever because you appreciate them a lot more. Yeah. That, I mean, that's true. It's true. It's, um, can, can you tell me, is there anything about filming? I know what you did last summer that you can tell like a little behind the scenes secrets sure. that, that you can share. I, I love that movie. So <laughs> sure man um i mean we had first of all everyone had a blast the four of us were great friends um galecki only worked a, a cool and he kind of had more experience than all of us um because of his years on roseanne right um right and uh who, and, oh and of course muse who i'm still friendly with to this day who plays our killer with the hook um and he just lives on a big farm in tennessee and just loves life and kicks back and every once in a while you'll see him on like on like a law and order or one of those shows. But uh, there, as far as like behind the scenes stuff, the fun stuff was more like Ryan and I sort of training together because they wanted both of us to, to kind of be in good shape and be young pretty boys in the movie. So our, we had the same trainer and we worked out a lot together together martial arts. Um, so that wasn't something that I could really share share with him but he had an interest in it. So we would discuss it from time to time. But um, I just, I mean, that was the time I think when, when him and Reese first got together and she came and visited on, on the set and everybody's, and, and Brian was like, he was the boy that every girl wanted. Cause Brian was like the, he has that, that James Dean sort of brooding. Right. You have to right. pry the love out of me. Whereas me, I'm just like, Hey, sure. I love you right on. If you act like a jerk, I'll punch you <laughs> in the face. But you don't have to, you know, I give everyone one great solid chance. And then if you screw that up, you're dead to me. But Ryan makes you earn it. And one isn't better than the other. They're just different. But Ryan's is sexier. And so I remember Reese coming out there and I was sitting with Sarah and Love and, uh, and Bridget. And I literally go, wow, a lot of chicks that hated Reese hate her a whole lot more now. Because <laughs> she just did bachelor number one off the market, baby. <laughs> Is that is that where you and Sarah started dating too? Did you guys meet on that set, or was we, it? We that? met there, but I had a girlfriend at the time, and uh, and she we became friends. It was funny; we had nothing in common. Here's this this Jewish girl from Manhattan who's been in this business since she was four years old, and then this like 
little Buddha who grew up in it, by the beach on surfing waves and in the middle of the <laughs> desert in New Mexico, raised by a bunch of Eastern philosophy, martial arts weirdos. <laughs> and our philosophies on life were night and day. She didn't have license. So I used to drive her from Wilmington, North Carolina, or from Southport, North Carolina to Wilmington. So we could go to the gym together. And I would be talking about philosophy and, and all these sort of like Prince Huarang from, from the stories of Lao Tzu and, and Taoism. And, and she'd be like, yeah, we need to work, have them work out reservations for us somewhere for dinner tonight. And it was so <laughs> like, we were just so night and day that neither one of us ever saw the other as a as a potential like partner a life partner any uh, anyone to be with but we became friends because we were complete and total opposites yeah and a lot of stuff that i was naive to she sharpened me up to and a lot of life that i felt she was missing i opened her eyes to right. and as we became friends it was a good i'd say two years maybe three years probably longer than that to, to be completely honest with you and then we went out to dinner one night and instead of it being friends at the end of that dinner it just she looked different to me and I looked different to her and we've been together ever since man like right. that was that was it it was that easy but I think it worked because we were friends first she knew what kind of dude I was she knew what kind of a boyfriend I was she knew I didn't fool around I knew what kind of woman she was I knew how straightforward she was and those were those were qualities that we both found attractive so I guess we just probably weren't in the right mental space to see each other as as lovers <laughs> at that age but as we got a little more mature, it was like, oh, my God, yeah, why aren't we doing this? I don't know if that was a subconscious or conscious thing. It was so long ago, but that's what happened. How many years have you guys been together now? 15, going on 16. Nice, man. nice. Congratulations. Hey, Sorry for the Blair Witch camera work. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> liking the Blair Witch. Blair Witch I mean, 6. You know, Sorry. it works for talking about I know what you did last summer, you know. Uh, Very, I'll go Dutch like Jim Gillespie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it looks like I lost your video. Oh, there you are. Okay. You did for a second. I got to walk because my battery is dying on this phone, but okay, I will no find a charger quickly, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can see. I'm getting like a tour of the house too, so it works out well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get a tour of the roof. Yeah. <laughs> and my nostril. <laughs> um, this is so the nostril. I, I know you did. Now that you've done one book, do you think you'll do a second book? Um, I think 100%. Yeah, sorry, I'm breaking everything, trying to find a charger before the phone does. Um, I would say 100% yes. My my editor and I, Dervla, who is really the only reason to write a book like this and, and oh, super Irish and super cool and loves science fiction like I do, so she gets a lot of my references. Right. And uh, so I have I have a couple ideas that I've run by her, one that's also in the cooking space and one that's more in the parenthood space. And, uh, you know, we, we're discussing them both, but I'm still in the middle of doing press for this book. So, I, you know, it's, it won't yeah. be today, but I had such a good experience and I like working with her so much. And I know she likes working with me that once she said jump, I would jump and we would get it done. Well, I think you know, when, I, when I did my first book, all it does is kind of helps you it creates these other ideas about like, oh, here's some fun things I want to do too. You know, you can't help but think about it once you kind of dive in. I agree. You know, hold on, my phone's acting fucking. There we go. Um, it, for me, it was like running a marathon. The first time I ever ran the Los Angeles Marathon, <laughs> and the science of it on your mind is crazy because you're just watching people drop left and right, right around mile 17. All you want to do is run another one. It's all you, yeah. you think, every mistake you made, right? Like everything you could have done different in hindsight and all your brain does is go, yeah, and then I'll do this and then I'll do that and then I'll do this. And you just, you get addicted to it, man. Well, I, I think that, you know, based on some of the things you said, I, we, I took some questions off of Twitter and Facebook. I think you saw that on there. Um, I, I've pared down like the most interesting and least offensive ones. So like, you know, we can go through some of those. People ask some I've, weird stuff. I'm sure I've heard them all, brother. Don't worry, man. I, well, offend me. <laughs> I, I've seen some of the things that you retweet that people tweet out to you. And I'm just like, you know, most of the people I follow are chefs, so I think the way that people behave towards them on social media is a little bit more respectable. Way different. You know? Way different. With actors and, like, you know, the non-chef space, I'm like, people can be kind of dicks. You know, it's just like the stuff that people say is it's, just blows my mind. It's that, whole, it's that whole Kathy Bates misery analogy, right? And this isn't, this isn't my analogy, but I don't remember who wrote this, but they're dead on. You know, it's that it's that need to control art now through social media. You feel like if you complain enough, 
you can affect change. But think about what those people are trying to do and what they're trying to implement themselves in. Imagine telling Jimi Hendrix he should play the guitar differently because <laughs> you want him to. But like Pablo Picasso didn't paint whales because he hated whales. It's because he just <laughs> never painted one. <laughs> like it's, that's, the artist dictates the art. Right. The audience does not. The audience receives the art. They can like it or dislike it, but they don't get, unless, unless it's a commission of a portrait, you don't get to say, oh, you're not killing the main character in my book. Right. Like, you're bringing her back to life or I'm going to break both your ankles, James Caan. <laughs> you don't get to do that. So when people try to do it with me, I laugh. It never offends me. I find it funny. I reposted just to sort of help educate. You know, I'm more yeah. into information than affirmation. <laughs> well, well, and you reposting it, I think, is actually what exposed me to it. I mean, like even, like, you know, a lot of people complain about YouTube commenters, but because mine's a cooking channel, I don't really get the sort of, you know, I get like occasionally one or two people who are kind of jerks to me, but like for the most part, they just want to sure. poach an egg. You know, they don't really care. Um, but, you know, because you repost stuff, I've actually seen like, wow, who says that? You know, like, but now I know. Now I know people actually say that. So, Oh, there's some whack jobs out there. It happens in the gamer world too, man. Don't don't worry. I know how to end. My day ends the same regardless of what they say. Like, I still go to bed with Sarah Michelle Geller every night. <laughs> I still go surfing almost every single day, regardless of whether somebody goes, you're a jerk or you're super cool. <laughs> like, it's all good, man. Well, none of these are none of these are mean ones. They're just some, I think, some fun questions. Um, all right, cool. So this one's from uh, speaking of Sarah Michelle Geller. This one's from at Buffy six 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 one three and. She wants to know what meal that you love to cook that maybe your kids and your wife don't actually like to eat. So if you have something that you like to make that's just a favorite of yours. I mean, or are you my, enchilada, my enchiladas are too spicy for the kids. The kids will not mess with that kind of heat. But Sarah likes everything that I've cooked. I screwed up Korean short ribs once, but that wasn't something that like I love that she hated. I just screwed them up. They were undercooked and inedible. But uh, <laughs> I screw stuff up too. But yeah, my kids probably like the, the, the enchiladas. I always have to make two versions of it. One with no heat and one with heat, which is a pain in the butt. But at least I can slowly introduce. I always put a little bit of heat in there. Because <laughs> that's how they got to get used to exactly, it. Exactly. You guys. But, uh, but there's not a dish that I make that I know they don't like. Because I'm their husband and their dad. Like I want to make stuff that they dig. <laughs> so, so no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there is. That's a, that's a good dad. That's a good, well, you know, I mean, I noticed in your book too, and I was, I didn't know that you were from New Mexico. You are from New Mexico, right? Yeah. I well, I was born in Los Angeles, but I spent most of my childhood there. Okay. So I was flipping through there and I'm like, there's a lot of green chili in here. You must love New Mexico or something. So I had, I had to Google it to like see, but um, I mean, obviously you love, I love heat too. I like to put heat in really weird, like I put, I make spicy popsicles. I put heat in everything I can possibly sneak it into. Oh, in New Mexico, they started making green chili wine. I was oh, like, all right, I'll try it. <laughs> I'll probably like it. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm with you on the heat one. Okay, so we have we have uh, Davis T23 here, and she wanted to know, she said there's probably, you probably come with a lot of recipes for this book. How do you decide what to put in the book and what to leave out? Well, it's not all my, it's not all my choice. There were a few that I wanted in there that, that didn't make the cut. At the end of the day, you and your editor are really the ones that, that make those decisions together. Um, but the buyer of your idea has final say. So there were, there were a few things that I, that I would have liked in there. There were even a couple stories that I, that I felt comfortable sharing that they were like, I don't know if you want to put that in there. And I was like, I wouldn't have written it if I wasn't cool with it. There's nothing out, out loud in front of them. So, uh, so at the end of the day, you know, they have final say. But um, I mean, I told you earlier in the in the interview, I probably had another another sixty recipes that that all could have gone maybe fit maybe closer to 50, 40, 40, between forty and fifty. And I don't want to act like I'm master chef, but uh, <laughs> but they they I felt you know a lot of them could have gotten in there, and there were a couple that on the final pass I was like, man, that's kind of boring, and I wanted things to be simple, but I still want them to be exciting. I was like, let's not do that. What about this? And my editor's mad cool. They're going to be like, yeah, okay, but what about this one? I like this too. I was like, yeah, okay, do that one. You're right. I'm going to move on. So, um, so that's kind of how that process worked. What's one of the recipes that you really wanted in the book that didn't make it in? Um, I had a French fry recipe that, uh, that had a lot of heat to it. And at the end of the day, I felt I had enough fried food in the book. And I had already done onion rings. And so it was kind of a pop-up between French fries or onion rings. And since everyone in the world 
knows what french fries are and and can make them i decided to do onion rings and honestly the the french fry recipe because you got to fry them twice basically it takes a little bit longer and it's a little bit harder and the onion rings one was easier so we went with the rings fair enough see i would have like thought oh the french fry it's really complicated look what i can do and then yeah so you made the start <laughs> well the, well we <laughs> thought the same thing and my editor thought better <laughs> <laughs> that's i self-published my first book yeah i did it through kickstarter oh, wow, so maybe, maybe that was the the problem i just needed to get an editor next time um yeah, but that takes mad guts, so I respect that too. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, I highly recommend it, and I know you have your your path, but I don't know if you've ever done anything on Kickstarter, but the community there is... I'm familiar, I'm familiar with it, and I respect it, but I've never done it. My buddy Greg Weissman did a Kickstarter for his... Uh, for an audio version of a book that he wrote, and so I helped kind of promote that, and I gave a few bucks to it. Okay, very cool. My, you know, my camera over here stopped really quick. I'm just going to go set that back up again, so I'll be right back. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm emotionally 12 years old. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm mentally the same. I get it. <laughs> um, I see your t-shirt, bro. Yeah. I got a video game t-shirt on. What are you saying, bro? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like all, I'm just like a t-shirt and jeans kind of guy. Like it's all about the nerdy t-shirts. I'm with it. <laughs> Although I don't have the plush mi Minnie Mouse, so you're you you are, but you do have a daughter, so you're kind of at least you have an excuse if it you know if it's not yours. <laughs> they're they're from grandma, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. Uh, I don't know what this person's handle is. It's like Charlu XX, but she wanted to know um, what's your favorite date night meal. Sarah's would be sea bass. Um, that like sugar lime sea bass, that would be her favorite. Um, but lately it has been uh, real thin breaded pork cutlets. Uh, so I'll just lightly bread them and then I'll put honey on top of that. And then I just put them in a skillet for like three minutes on each side. I don't even need to serve my pork chops, so to speak, with <laughs> applesauce because they're already sweet. Toasted beets and some like little tiny potatoes. Um, or maybe a green vegetable, and that'll be the date. But she loves, right now, we've probably had that breaded pork chop or pork cutlet probably a dozen times in the last two months. Like, she she goes bananas for that right now. So how do you decide who wins? Who's going to get their meal for date night? <laughs> it's not it's not a comp. I don't compete, man. If that's what she wants, that's what I cook. I ask her every night, hey, what do you want for dinner? If she says, you pick, then I pick. But I'm all about making the people I cook for happy. Um, I want to give them what they want. So if she says, hey, I'm in the mood for, for mussels and clams, and I'm going to the, to the fish market or the store to get mussels and clams. Like, even if I wanted a steak, that's what I'm going to make. And I'll be happy as a pig and shit because <laughs> that makes me happy to do that. Does, um, now, we, I mean to curse. That's an old saying my grandpa used to say. It's just oh, I, I swear all the time okay. on my channel, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. cool. <laughs> my, my audience is is used to much, much worse. So, um, all right. Fantastic. Uh, so what's the, what's the kitchen routine? Like is, are the kids and Sarah, are they the sous chefs? Do you do all the work? Who does the dishes? How does, how does it work when you guys are, when you're cooking? I cook and clean for the most part, but Sarah, if I cook really wants to clean it and help out, but most of the time I just start to chill out. Um, my kids, my son is still at sous, sous chef level. <laughs> Although his health isn't that helpful, it's more destructive. <laughs> but my daughter can do a whole meal by herself. Oh, wow. Like I'll sous chef for her and she'll do a Korean beef recipe. That's all her. She's cooking with ginger and soy sauce and she made dinner for her other. And when you can get your kids to cook and prepare their own food, they don't complain about how it tastes because yeah. they made it and they don't want to hurt their own feelings. They're fine hurting your feelings. <laughs> they don't want to hurt their own. Right. So that's something that I encourage my daughter to do a lot. I let her, I try to let her prepare snacks. 
and I'll, sh- I'll put a bunch of things out on the counter like salami and cheese and olives and cherries and peaches and plums, whatever I can get. And I'll let her mix and match and she'll put the platter together and that's her healthy snack. So that's how we started. And from the snacks, we moved on to breakfast and from breakfast, we moved on to dinners. Um, lunches are easy because she gets lunch at her school, so she doesn't have to make it. But, uh, but everything else, like she can cook a lot of things by herself now. The only thing I don't let her fool with is fire because that's a data job. And I don't let her, you know, handle a knife unaccompanied. I'm always with her when she has her knife. Very cool. Very cool. And you guys, like, you pretty much cook every night. Are you guys, is eating at home a big part of? At least four nights a week. At least four nights a week. We like to go out for, for pizza every once in a while or sushi every once in a while. Like, my kids go crazy for sushi. We live in L.A. It's as abundant as the sand at the beach. So <laughs> we we go as, off, as often as we can as, and as often as – as we can afford to, to be honest, but, uh, but about four nights a week, we're here at the house and my, my daughter cooks probably 30, 40% of her meals. Very cool. Very cool. That's, that's impressive. Yeah, she's a girl. Was that my son eats a hundred percent of the meals, but he's not big on the cooking as much as he is <laughs> the eating. He's the younger one though, right? Yeah. He's the babe. So he doesn't have the skills yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cool. I think that's, that's great. I, you know, I think getting, it actually leads right into my next question. So this is from, um, at JL, JL Conan. She wanted to know like what your kids request the most from you to cook. Uh, <laughs> okay. So my daughter, it's mussels and clams. That's her favorite food. She'll have mussels for dessert. If you make that the <laughs> offer and she did it, we took her to Catalina Island. We went to a fish place. She got mussels and clams for lunch. Afterwards, I said, "You want some ice cream before we get back on the before we, you know, head back to uh to the mainland?" And she said, "We're having dessert." I said, "Yeah." She goes, "Can I just have more mussels and clams, Dad?" So <laughs> that's that's what she asks for the most. My son will ask for either pork chops, which is the one that's in the in the cookbook because it's got honey on it, um, or he wants steak, steak for days, meat, meat. He's just all meat all the time. Whereas my daughter, honestly, she eats fish and chicken but if you only brought vegetables to the table and tofu like she would be fine with that like she doesn't crave steak the way that that i did as a kid and still do or the way that that my son or my wife do she's very she's very very different she's honestly a better eater than my son but that's one of those things where times and she'll occasionally eat it that if she says dad i'm not really in the mood for that i don't give her a hard time she'll eat a burger she doesn't have a hard time with that. She loves sausage on pizza, things like that. But it's just sometimes the consistency of steak she's just not down with. Hmm. Sometimes. Do you, uh, do, has it been hard to sort of instill healthy eating habits in your kids? Or are they just kind of, you know, do you feel like they don't, cooking with them is... They don't have... They have no say in that conversation. So <laughs> they eat healthy. And if they complain, that's game over. It's, you know, that's not the time to be friends with your kids. Yeah. Meal time is the time to be the boss and it's the time to be in charge. If you went up to my daughter and, 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 she, and I wasn't with you, she would yell stranger and kick you in the balls. But if you were with me, um, <laughs> if you were okay. with I'll me, I will wear a cup if I ever see your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> just hang with me. You'll, you'll be okay. <laughs> but if you ask her like, how many times Charlotte, do you have to try something before you can say you don't like it? And she'll roll her eyes and say 10 times. And then you'll say how many times after that? And she'll roll her eyes again and go 10 more because there is no end. Like you will eat it until it's gone. If you don't finish it in the first 10 bites, that's how many more times you have to try it. So that's how it was in my house. That's how it is in my wife's in my house. Hopefully that's how it'll be in in my children's home one day when they have kids and they have no say their kids had say when I was a kid, I would have had, Alexander the Grape Otter Pops for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that would have been game over, man. But I had no say. So I grew up healthy and and happy. And I didn't know and I didn't want for cake for breakfast because it was never an option. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That's great. I think that's – it's important, you know, because I, I think a lot of kids just are allowed to do whatever. And you it's see tough. those – Bro, you being a parent when they're older. older. As hell. And when you get home from work – and it's time to feed the kids and they give you a hard time. I get it. The last thing you want to do is have it out. So don't, don't have it out. Go Zen master, go silent mode on him. Ignore the question. Do I have to finish? Don't even respond. 
dad, do I have to finish? Don't even respond. They'll figure it out. Oh, why is it? Oh, he wants me to finish. And they will. You just gotta kind of be a dick for a little bit. <laughs> Fair enough. This is why your daughter's going around kicking people on the balls, though, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Although her wife is the more violent one, or my wife's the more violent one. <laughs> well, I've seen enough of Buffy to know. <laughs> That's right. See, you know, I'm, she's all about war. <laughs> it's the, the yin and the yang. Um, so my mom, my mom wants to know about. Uh, she, you know, she's over there in the corner. She wants to like holiday meals. How those work at your house? Like, do you also cook all of those? Is that like a group effort? Because um, I take I take a lot of I take a lot of pride in creating that meal. Um, I put my Thanksgiving well, one of my Thanksgiving menus in the in the book. And uh, there's a couple things that my daughter does. Like she makes the spaghetti squash. Um, she's also made a our, our spaghetti squash soup that we made one time because nobody wanted spaghetti squash. So we just turned it into soup. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, that's a meal that, that I want to really put my hands on in, in every way, shape and form. Like I want guests to come over and I either want them talking and having conversation or enjoying football or listening to music or whatever it is they drink. And then I want them to eat the meal that I prepare for them. So I let my daughter make the thing that she's going to be responsible for. But everyone else, they always, let me bring something. And I, I ask them, I say, you know, please don't. If you want to bring some wine, that's fine. You know, if, if you want to bring some beer, that's fine. But let me cook for you and let me prepare this meal for you and just come and enjoy. And you don't get to clean. You don't get to cook. You just get to chill and have fun. That's usually, I don't, look, I'm not a, I'm not a fascist making, <laughs> forcing my morality upon you, but, but I ask people not to. And if they want to help and do some dishes, I say, okay, fine. Here's some dishes. You can help me out. But I prefer to just take care of guests when they come over for holidays. You, you don't let Sarah like bake something from food stores at least just to kind of, you know. Does, Sarah does all our baking. She and, and that's fine. Like we share the oven space. She does all our baking. I had to bake as a kid for hometown buffet and was on the graveyard shift there in high school. So my family wouldn't lose their house. And uh, so if I don't bake ever again for the rest of my life, I'm thrilled. <laughs> uh, that was two years of just hell. Um, you don't want to be working midnight to 6 a.m. when you're in high school because the first yeah. three classes you have, you get D's. <laughs> just the way life works. <laughs> That's good to know. So what's what's your favorite yeah. thing that Sarah bakes? Oh, man. Uh, the Foodsters brownies are bomb but she just made these uh these star cookies these like star these fourth of july sugar cookies that my kids split one because i ate three so uh so that should let you know that i that i enjoyed it and didn't leave any of them <laughs> it sounds like a very entertaining household <laughs> and we're a bunch of weirdos man we're a weird family but we make each other laugh awesome awesome um well, so I'm gonna. We've been talking for a while. I don't want to take up your whole day. So I just want to ask you though, what's what's for dinner tonight? What are you making? Well, tonight it will be the the famous grocery store run. Um, when we finish this this interview, I go to the valley for a meeting, and on the way back, I'll go to the grocery store. And the grocery store run is I see what looks freshest. I see what inspires me, and uh, I sound like the girl in Lethal Weapon too, the British actress. Uh, what was her name? The really pretty one, something Kensit. Where she says, "Well, I'll never know what I'll be hungry for from one moment to the next." That's how that's how I am. So I try to shop on a more daily, a more frequent basis. Like, I go in, I see what inspires me, I grab it, I come home, I cook it, um, unless I get a request. So on my way to the to my meeting, I'll say, "Sarah, you got any ideas for dinner?" Sarah will say, "No, you pick." I know this because we've been together forever. And uh, on the way home, I'll go to the store and I'll find something yummy and uh, and bring it home and cook it. But I don't know yet. I'll tell you what: when I get to the store. I'll take some pictures of some stuff and I'll, I'll tweet them out to you and you can help me pick. You can help me pick what's good. <laughs> or something and have people, you know, <laughs> that's right. I need to be able to do like a Twitter vote where you just pick, are we doing steak, fish or chicken? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds epic. And I totally think you should do it at least like once a month. Just Except then, that's when you get the, that's when you get the awesome trolls who don't vote for any of them. They go, you should have picked sausage. You suck at coaching. <laughs> <laughs> awesome I, well I, I, that, you know i do that too i think like i use the farmer's market that way there's like we have a farmer's market that's around the corner and it's just like i go troll the seasonal stuff and it's like whatever you know inspires me and i go for it. Dude, it's like for it's like foraging it in heaven yeah <laughs> <laughs> instead of the forest like the farmer's markets are bomb wherever yours is 
go out and find it. In LA, there's so many of them, they have delivery services that will take up all the surplus that they can't sell and deliver it to your house for crazy cheap. Wow. So we just do that now. Sometimes the fruit goes bad in like a day, but yeah. the vegetables are always bomb and they last forever. And we use that service all the time, man, all the nice. time. Nice, nice. Well, you know, when you do your next book, I'm hoping we can have you back on the show. Um, Absolutely, I'll, man. I'll bust out my other Star Wars t-shirt. I have a, I have a, a line of them, you know, so I have other ones to wear. I'll rock my Vader, I'll rock my Darth Vader shirt next time. <laughs> nice, <laughs> awesome. Um, and thank you so much for chatting with me today. My mom's waving goodbye, and stuff like that from the corner. She's... <laughs> <Hi, Mom. laughs> um, and yeah, thanks for chatting with me today. And I'm, I, what I'm going to do, so I, when I do these interviews, I always do a recipe with it. I think I'm going to make that French toast again, the, your mom's French toast. Um, follow up with that. My mom's French toast is the bomb. And if you use the Grand Marnier, give yourself a little sip, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I always do that. That's how I make margaritas. There's like the shot for tequila and then like, you know, yeah. So that's how it goes. Oh my God. When I used to have, I had a sitcom on TV like 10 years ago. It was just called Freddy. And the prop yeah. master at the end of every tape night would make margaritas. And the trick to his margaritas was after all the mix was together, he would pour a Corona in there <laughs> and then blend it up. And I'm telling you, because it all of a sudden had this like bubbly, slushy Seven nope. Eleven vibe. Yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> if, you, if you've been to, uh, I'm sure you've been to Austin. You've been to Austin, Texas, I'm sure. But like, um, yeah, you can go there. They have uh, the Mexican Bulldog Margarita. Have you had one of those? No, I would. I I honestly only went to like music bars the last time I was there, and I wasn't drinking back then, so I didn't drink at all. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I have, I'll send you a recipe. I have it on my site too, but it's called the Mexican Bulldog Margarita and you flip a Corona up inside it. So it's just like... See, they, see, they know, they know what's up. Yeah, they totally know what's I love Austin. It's just a great, great, it's like the, this amazing place that's hard to believe it's in Texas sometimes, but it's just this amazing, amazing town. It's a, it's this little artistic pocket in the middle of oil town. And yeah. it just doesn't <laughs> make sense, but maybe that's why it works so well. I love it there. I love it. Yeah, it's a great one. Well, we'll talk. Well, maybe your next book will be on Texas, Texas food, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless what it's about, we'll talk again. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining me today, Freddie. Uh, glad we got through the technical stuff. It was great to talk about your book. Um, you want to just give out a shot where people can find this? You can go to back. Let me go Dutch angle, Jim Gillespie. I know you did last summer style. You can go <laughs> to back to the kitchen book. <laughs> dot com or Barnes and Noble or Amazon or anywhere else you want to go. Um, yeah, just you can find it on Twitter on my homepage. Um, you can find it on my Instagram page. It's back to the kitchen book dot com. Where you order books from? I I, I want to have a dinner party with this book called I Know What You Did Last Supper. Like just you know <laughs> last supper. I like it. And then the photo <laughs> has to be you and all your friends like with your hands out like Jesus, right? <laughs> one of your friends has to have like. Look right, and he's gonna cut your throat, and then you're right. like, you guys gotta react the whole thing. <laughs> Guy with a hook, it would be perfect. It'll be perfect. Um, sweet. Uh, you, and yes, you give him a hook. That's perfect. <laughs> oh, yo, you need to recreate that. I'm not joking. That would be. I favorite. will totally. I will totally do that. <laughs> that could be like your photo for your next book too. You could just you know. Have there you go. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. All right, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate it again, man. Thanks for the time. Yeah, of course. Like I said, seriously, how great is Freddie? I mean, super fun to talk to, amazing guy, really down to earth. I really, really enjoyed that interview. Freddie, thank you so much for sitting down with me and chatting. And just to show you my appreciation, I'm gonna get to cooking. I'm gonna make your mom's French toast, the Grand Marnier French toast from Back to the Kitchen. Get it if you can. And I'm gonna amp it up a few levels because I, I can never just leave any, like good enough is never enough, right? So I'm gonna take that French toast and I'm gonna stuff it with orange marmalade and a ginger infused whipped cream. I think you're definitely gonna like it. So let's get, let, I'm gonna get back to cooking. Okay, let's get back to the kitchen. So I told Freddie I was gonna modify his recipe a little bit and I'm gonna do that by making a ginger infused whipped cream. So I have a tablespoon of freshly chopped ginger there. And now I'm just gonna pour in some heavy whipping cream. And I'm gonna infuse this, I'm gonna just let it sit in the fridge overnight. That's what I'm gonna use for the French toast. Okay, so we have our infused cream. I'm just gonna strain out the cream from the ginger just by pouring this through here. Add in some vanilla extract. It's about a quarter teaspoon of sugar. And 
we have our ginger whipped cream. I think it's, uh, it's gonna be pretty good. It definitely is. Okay, to make this French toast, first thing we're gonna do, crack some eggs. We have an egg here. I'm just gonna whisk that together. The next thing we're gonna whisk in is some half and half. Gonna add in vanilla extract, some orange juice, freshly squeezed, some orange zest, freshly zested, a little bit of sugar, and the secret ingredient, Grand Marnier. Let's whisk this all together. Yeah, it's looking pretty good there. I think we're ready to make some French toast. And we're just gonna transfer some of our batter to a shallow dish, like so. And then we're gonna just start dipping our bread in it. And fry this baby up. Big thank you to Freddie's mom for this recipe because it it's pretty amazing. Okay, so now we did the Freddie Prince Jr. part. Now we're gonna do the Jerry part. So we're gonna take this amazing Grand Marnier stuffed French toast. I'm gonna top it with a little bit of orange marmalade. I know what you're thinking. Orange marmalade, it's like, just something old people eat, but trust me, like in this stuffed French toast, you're gonna love it. So just spread out the orange marmalade. Hey, now we're gonna top it with the ginger infused whipped cream that we made earlier. Spread that out. Add another layer of French toast and top it all off with some powdered sugar. So seriously, how delicious does this French toast look? Grand Marnier French toast, whipped cream that's infused with ginger, orange marmalade, Super decadent. I mean, this is the thing that's to die for. I have to say, thank you, Freddie. This is a great recipe. Big thanks to your mom for putting in the uh, uh, in the cookbook. That was my mom, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so I guess my mom's eating it. I am not eating it. Um, so thank your mom for me, and I, <laughs> I give up. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>